So our first speaker this morning is Dr. Julio Betancourt. Julio is a senior scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey. He um, was one of only two DOI scientists, Department of Interior, for those of you who don't know federal acronyms, um, to receive the Presidential Rank Service Award from the White House in 2008, and he was elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2009. Julio has uh, co-founded the USA National Phenology Network and is leading the effort to control buffalo grass spread in the Sonoran Desert. It's my pleasure to introduce Julio. Good morning, and thanks for the introduction, Mark. And thanks, Darren, and others for the invitation to come and um, address uh, restoring uh, the West. So I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to be talking about climate variability, climate change, and large-scale ecological responses, and point out some of the challenges for ecosystem science and management uh, in the West. I'm going to actually organize my talk uh, in three general sections, and uh, the first section is actually looking at what I call decadal to multi-decadal uh, climate variability, and I'll argue that we actually haven't reckoned with low frequency climate variability, which will make it that much harder to reckon with climate change. And then I'm going to turn to talking a little bit about the secular trends that we've had in, uh, in climate, particularly temperature, um, over the last century, and uh, do a little bit of detection and attribution, sort of lay it out for you uh, in a little bit more detail. And then at the end of my talk, I'm going to start making some comments about ecosystem responses to both climate variability and climate change and uh, lay out um, a few challenges. So what exactly do I mean by decadal to multi-decadal uh, variability? So these are long intervals when the observations remain either above or below the mean. This is something that we're very familiar with and that is the clustering of wet years and the clustering of dry years uh, through time. So this is characteristic of the instrumental record of the past century and the tree ring record of the past couple of millennia. Uh, one of the, the things that characterizes this kind of variability, uh, much more so than interannual variability, decadal to multi-decadal variability is synchronized across multiple basins. So we actually tend to see the same thing, uh, for example, from the Rio Grande Basin to the Colorado, the Columbia, and the Missouri basins, we tend to see the same, the same trends uh, at decadal to multi-decadal timescales, which means that we have challenges because everything is happening all at once at the subcontinental scale at these decadal to multi-decadal scales. So you're probably wondering exactly what is the forcing for this kind of variability. And as you might imagine, probably the, the thing with the most memory in the climate system is actually the oceans. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how the oceans contribute to the patterns and sources of uh, decadal to uh, multi-decadal climate variability. And also I'll point out the fact that this may be, may or may not be predictable. In other words, there may be uh, predictability at the decadal uh, time scale, and there may not. And it all depends on exactly how predictable the North Atlantic Ocean variability, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, the Marriott meridional overturning, uh, the thermal hailing circulation, how predictable that is given its persistence and its inherent persistence and also uh, the teleconnections that come out of the, uh, of the North Atlantic uh, to other areas in the world. It's really unclear how a decadal uh, to multi-decadal variability will function uh, with, with climate change. Uh, but I want to point out right from the very beginning that the key time scale uh, for adaptation to climate change is going to end up being decadal. You know, it's not century scale. We're not going to be adapting to things that happen a century from now. We're going to be adapting to things that happen in the next few years to the next couple of decades. So this is the key time scale for uh, adaptation. Uh, I've already mentioned this already, but water and natural resource management has glossed over the problems posed by this kind of low frequency variability. So basically, we haven't reckoned with it. I mean, we still haven't reckoned with the fact that uh, we use the wettest period in the last few thousand years, or in the last uh, thousand years, that we use the wettest period as uh, the period of record for allocating Colorado River water in the Colorado River Compact in 1921. So we still haven't reckoned with this kind of variability in water planning, much less in natural resource management. 
Here's an example of decadal and multidecadal variability. This is actually a precipitation reconstruction that we did for uh, the uh, Yellowstone uh, area. So it's an 820 year reconstruction. And you can see this sort of slow variability over time, over those 820 years, uh, which is, cons is a consistent feature of long duration climate reconstructions. It stays even after you statistically remove the low order persistence and then it has significantly higher uh, multi-decadal, decadal to multi-decadal power than, than just uh, simple red noise. <clears throat> we actually, we're all very familiar with this. In fact, many of us can actually point out cultural events uh, that are linked to this kind of variability. Uh, for example, the great drought in the late 13th century uh, when we had abandonment by the Anasazi of the Four Corners area. Um, <clears throat> there was also things like the 16th century uh, mega drought, which was followed by a relatively wet period, and then another drought ensued in the 17th century that actually led to the Pueblo Revolt in New Mexico. There's the overallocation of the Colorado River at the of the Colorado River at the beginning of the century, followed by the 1950s drought, and then followed by this big step change in uh, precipitation, and actually in temperature, right around 1976, that's linked to Pacific decadal variability. Now, there are a lot of reasons why this kind of slow variability is important, but one of them is that it plays a major role in resetting the composition and structure of ecosystems. So I've put the yellow arrows, uh, arrows there um, on the graph. Uh, this is the uh, Cook Southwest Drought Index based on the reconstructed Palmer Drought Severity Index uh, for the Southwest. And those yellow arrow, arrows actually denote periods of time when you have an extreme drought followed by a relatively wet period afterwards. And so what generally happens during those periods uh, of drought is that you get broad scale disturbance, including things like fires and bark beetle outbreak, outbreaks and drought die offs. And in the wake of those disturbances and the ensuing wet period, you end up getting recovery. Now, if things change ever so slightly, you can actually get migration. And in fact, um, we are now on the verge of demonstrating that at the end of the medieval warm period between 900 and 1300 AD, um, those droughts ended up causing so much disturbance that both pinyon pines actually established uh, their northern peripheral isolates um, right after that time or right at the end of that time. So migration probably occurred in the wake of disturbances that happened during the medieval uh, warm period and in the ensuing wet period you ended up having uh, pinyon pine uh, expand its range by long distance dispersal and subsequent spread. So this kind of cycling back and forth between dry and wet period is absolutely absolutely the critical process for getting changes in in the composition and structure of, of our ecosystems from the deserts um, all the way uh, into our forests. So if you were a manager uh, and of, let's say, water or anything else, and you were around for the last thousand years or so, these are some of the challenge, challenges that would have been posed by decadal to multi-decadal variability. This is a reconstruction of Colorado River um, flow at Lee's Ferry from uh, seven, 762 to 2002. So let's go through this briefly. These are 25-year running means of the reconstructed uh, annual flow of the Colorado River. Uh, expressed as the uh, percentage of the 1906 to 2004 mean. So uh, if you would have been around during the medieval warm period and in that period between 900 and 1100, uh, the flow would have been below the mean and it would have been more or less stationary through time. In other words, the mean in the moments of the distribution didn't change much. So, so long as you were managing for the mean, you would have done very well. However, if you were around between 1130 and 1150, um, you would have been pulling your hair out because you were in the middle of the worst mega drought actually in the last thousand years. If you were in the 13th century, you would have actually uh, been pulling your hair out as well because you started out wet and you ended up really, really dry um, with, with the great drought at the end of the 13th century. Uh, in the 1300s, it would have been relatively wet. Uh, the variance would have been dampened, so you probably would have done really well. But then you got, in the ensuing period, you got into this sort of decadal to multi-decadal uh, period when it was hard to know exactly where you were going to be. Again, dampened in the 1700s and then back to that sort of extreme decadal, multi-decadal pattern that continues today. So this is what I mean by decadal to multi-decadal variability. And imagine the challenges that you would have 
in any one of these periods, which are totally within the realm of expectation uh, in the future. So the reason that it's really important is that it has these large-scale impacts. In other words, this synchronicity across huge areas. So this is um, western uh, U.S. percentage area wet or dry based on the Palmer Drought Severity Index over the last century, showing these periods of drought that show up, for example, 1896 to 1904, the 30s, the 50s, and the late 1980s, and then that drought that happened in 1999 to 2004 centered in 2002 and 2003. And then at the bottom you have the wet periods, the uh, early uh, 20th century wet period, uh, this very, very wet El Nino year from 1940 to 41. Uh, the early 1980s were wet as were the 1990s. But this was pretty much at the subcontinental scale. This is the pattern. These are the patterns that you got. So, as I mentioned before, the likely source of this kind of variability is the oceans. And there's a lot of discussion about uh, climatic, large-scale climatic indices, geophysical indices, and how they might actually capture this variability. So, for a long, long time, we've been aware of the fact that El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, in the tropical Pacific, uh, this fluctuation in both sea surface temperature and sea surface pressures across the Pacific, um, was not just a statistical phenomenon, but also a physical phenomenon that you could actually model. Um, the other kinds of uh, uh, sea surface temperature indices uh, or geophysical indices like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation are not as well known. And in fact, for the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, we're still arguing whether or not it's a statistical artifact because we really can't model it uh, using uh, couple ocean atmosphere models very well. So we know that there are a lot of correlations with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, particularly in the western U.S., as most of you know, but we don't really know the extent to which this is actually a physical phenomenon. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is actually defined as the standardized leading principal component of monthly SST temperatures in the North Pacific poleward of 20 degrees. The Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation is defined as a 10-year running mean of detrended SST anomalies averaged from about 0 to 70 uh, north uh, over the North Atlantic. It's actually more than likely a physical phenomenon because it may be the surface expression of the thermal hailing circulation or the, uh, uh, the meridional overturning. So I think most everybody is actually convinced that this is a real physical phenomenon with a lot of memory. Uh, the the, 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 the uh, uh, frequency spectra of the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation is as much as you know, 30 to 70 years. So the other thing that we're actually really concerned about is how these oceans interact. Um, <clears throat> how does the AMO interact with the PDO? And how, does, how do the PDO and the AMO interact with ENSO? Uh, ENSO also is not only interannual variability, but also has decadal to multi-decadal variability, and I'll show you some of that in a second. So one of the questions is, um, you know, how does the low-frequency ENSO variability affect variability of the PDO and the AMO, or vice versa. Is there a possibility that either the PDO or the AMO is actually modulating low frequency variability in ENSO? If it's the Atlantic, there may be a lot of predictability to the climate system because of the uh, teleconnections associated with ENSO, particularly in the western U.S. in the boreal winter. So if you do a principal component analysis of sea surface temperatures of, of uh, for, in this case, 10-year moving average, detrended annual global SST uh, over the 20th century, you get these two patterns. And the pattern at the top is showing that the North Atlantic is actually um, in, in, in one phase as opposed to uh, the other oceans. Um, the first principal component looks very much like the AMO. In fact, explains about 28% of the variance. Uh, it looks just like the AMO, and I'll show you uh, not the loadings, but actually the scores of the time series in a second. And then the second pattern of variability looks just like the PDO. Uh, in other words, um, you know, a, a relatively cold tropical Pacific and then warm waters um, advected across the, uh, um, the, the coast of the, the Western Americas. So these are the two main patterns of ocean sea surface temperature variability at the global scale. These are the scores from the principal component analysis. Um, so these are the time series, and what I've done is I've plotted the time series of the AMO on the left as well as the uh, score of the, of the first principal component. 
And then I've done the same thing for the PDO, and you can see that the two are one and the same. So you've probably seen this figure many, many times. This is the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation with its positive phase on the left and its negative phase on the right. Almost looks like a, a, a decadal version of, of ENSO with uh, El Nino on the left and La Nina on the right. And then there is the time series at the bottom with the inflection points uh, right around 1940, uh, 43, some people say 46, and uh, then right around 1996. So between 1943 and 1976, uh, it was the, uh, uh, the Pacific was actually in its negative, uh, the PDO was in its negative phase. And what that generally means is that the West is dry, particularly the Southwest, and the Pacific Northwest is actually wet. Uh, when it's in its positive phase, the Pacific, it turns around and it's in opposite fashion. And the Pacific uh, Northwest is actually wet and then the Southwest is dry. And the Great Basin lies somewhere in between. So for the AMO, I wanted to go into a little bit more detail just to give you some background. Um, there is this thing called the thermohaline circulation, this conveyor belt of water. And in the North Atlantic, it goes as follows. You have warm waters evicted uh, from, the trop from, the, uh, uh, from the tropical Atlantic um, to the north, and then it, uh, those waters, as they go north, get colder and they evaporate, so they get denser, um, uh, they get more saline and colder, uh, and then they get denser. They sink at depth once they cross the Greenland to Scotland sill. Uh, the water sinks at depth and then returns. When you see that uh, conveyor belt over on the left, it generally takes about a thousand years for a packet of water to make it all the way around. So there's a lot of memory in this, uh, in this intrinsic system in, in, in the ocean. So the time series down below uh, of the AMO shows these inflection points right around 1930 and 1960. Uh, 1930 to 1960 is that really uh, Atlantic hurricane intense period that then returned after 1995 when the North Atlantic went uh, warm again. So this is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. It has some interesting features in the sense that it's, it's really persistent once it's in a certain regime. But something that's curious about it is that it tends to turn on a dime, meaning that when it shifts re regimes, it can actually shift in a matter of months. So while there's quite a bit of predictability in its persistence, there's less predictability in, 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 in the shifting of regimes. So um, aside from the oceans, there's other things to consider, and that is, you know, how are you going to move, uh, how are you going to move that energy in the oceans around? And uh, in particular, you know, uh, how, how does the uh, upper air circulation, uh, how, do, how does the earth circulation actually behave, particularly at high latitudes? And so what I've done here is plotted up the winter jet stream, which in the boreal winter in Western North America allows us to actually integrate or not integrate temperate and tropical weather systems. So there's variability also in upper air circulation that may or may not be uh, linked to the oceans, uh, directly meaning um, the oceans may not cost that uh, upper air uh, uh, variability, that circulation variability, it may actually be the other way around. So a couple of indices, uh, just to get you up on these things. One of them is the Pacific North American Index. Uh, the pattern of the PNA is actually shown in that uh, map uh, at the top that shows these Z points uh, where we either add or subtract uh, pressures at 500 millibars or 500 pascals um, in order to come up with an index that defines the Rosby wave, defines th the actual shape of, of the jet stream. And uh, below is the actual time series uh, of the PNA for December, January, February. This has been known for a long time. It's been used a lot. It is actually highly predictive. One of the lamentable things is that the general circulation models do not characterize the PNA very well. So that, that is actually problematic because it actually defines so much of the circulation, particularly in the area of interest, which is the Western US. The other mode of circulation is actually the Northern Annular Mode or the NAM. And this is the equivalent of the Arctic Oscillation. And it's basically this oscillation between the polar latitudes and the mid-latitudes. And think, of, think about it as a fulcrum of air mass volume, where you know, sometimes there's more air mass volume at mid-latitudes, and sometimes there's more air, air mass volume uh, in, near the poles. 
And this shift is actually accomplished by random daily storm activity. Uh, below is the uh, time series uh, of the NAM, um, you know, showing again there's this inflection uh, right in the uh, uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s. And you'll see this pattern over and over and over again, this north-south pattern uh, you'll see in a lot of things. In fact, I'll be talking about spring indices, and you'll see exactly that pattern in the second principal component of a spring index that I'm going to show you in a little while. So one of the things that you have to think about is that none of these modes of variability acts independently. They, they're complementary modes, uh, whether they're ocean ones or, uh, or they're um, uh, upper air circulation ones. And so for the PDO and the AMO, you can see these complementary modes when the PDO may be in its positive phase, the AMO also in its positive phase. Or you, you might be in the positive phase of the AMO but negative for the PDO, or both of them may be negative, or the PDO may be positive and the AMO may be negative. And so it's in conjunction that these, um, that these modes can actually produce patterns in hydroclimatology over the United States. I'm just putting a couple of examples here where I'm taking the AMO and I'm making it negative, in other words, North Atlantic being cold, and then I'm shifting the PDO. And what you can see is, for the most part, um, the United States is relatively wet when the AMO is in its negative phase. And if you shift the PDO, all you do is you shift the areas of drought uh, between the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest. Uh, the same thing holds true when you shift the PDO uh, but you've got the North Atlantic in its positive phase, except that when it's in its positive phase, most of the country is actually dry. So North Atlantic, uh, when it's cold, it's generally wet. Um, when it's warm, it's relatively dry across the continental U.S. So let's shift here and talk a little bit about climate change in the West. And these are things that everybody here has heard about, right? We've had this one to two degree warming since the 1980s longer and hotter growing seasons, less snowpack, earlier snow melt and stream flow, more uh, frequent large fires, more extensive bark beetle outbreaks, etc. Now 60 percent of everything I just said has been recently attributed in a detection and attribution study uh, to greenhouse gases and this is done by taking general circulation models, passing them through downscaled uh, regional models and then passing them through hydrologic models. And uh, so the argument by Tim Barnett and others in 2008 in this paper in Science was that 60% of that is due to greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not so sure, um, and I think it bears looking into uh, for reasons that will become apparent in a minute. The other thing that has happened, uh, particularly out of the last IPCC uh, report in 2007, is that there were about 19 models, and for the most part, uh, all but I think one or two predicted less precipitation at subtropical latitudes and more at high latitudes, and the Great Basin lies somewhere in between. Um, so now it looks like it's, it's fairly probable that regional climate has exited the envelope of natural variability and the past is no longer indicative of the future. In other words, this concept that I'll talk about a little bit later, of uh, this concept of stationarity, um, is no longer true. And that is a serious thing uh, because now we have to adapt to a moving target when we've basically been aiming for a stable envelope of natural variability. In some cases, extreme variability, even extreme decadal to multi-decadal variability, but at least it's within a well-defined envelope of variability. So I, I've put this up. This is a paper that just came out by Wang et al. in 2009 in Journal of Climate. I urge you to read it because it's really telling. So these guys were doing a detection attribution study uh, looking at the seasonality and regionality of climate trends in the U.S. from 1950 to, to 2000. And so you have the seasons of the year, and then uh, from uh, December, January, February to September, October, November. You have the observed on the right, and then using a uh, couple ocean atmosphere models that are actually um, initiated with the prescribed historical SST temperature trends, uh, they actually try to match uh, what happens in the observed record, and they do a fairly good job. So one of, the, one of the things that should jump out at you is um, this warming that occurs uh, in, the, in, in the upper Midwest and in, in the western United States in the cool season. But notice that that's not the case for the summertime and certainly not the case for, for the fall. Um, and this shows up in both the observed and the modeled. 
Um, what these guys end up concluding about temperature in doing a principal component analysis of the model results is that <coughs> um, the first principal component, in other words, most of the variability is due to Pacific uh, decadal variability. The second principal component is actually uniform warming in all regions and at all seasons. And then the third principal compo component is actually the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. So, you know, it's not like we can stand anywhere on this map and say global warming is happening and it's happening because of greenhouse gases. This is relatively com complex both regionally and seasonally. So <clears throat> this is a slide that Mike Dettinger put together and that I use a lot. This is annual surface air temperature anomalies, uh, warming in the western U.S. versus the, the, the global warming, the global warming being in those uh, colored bars, and then uh, for the western states, the warming being in, or the uh, temperature being uh, in the blue line. And I just want to point out that for the western, the western U.S., has much more extreme trends uh, than the average uh, uh, global trends. And in particular, note this exiting of the envelope of natural variability right around uh, the late 1970s, mid-1980s, which we see in just about everything. And in fact, here's March, April, May mean minimum temperatures uh, for each of uh, the western states uh, showing that same exiting. This shows up at the county level, it shows up at the state level. This is not the tyranny of averages of spatial averaging. This is actually uh, just about everywhere in the West. But also notice that there's a little bit of a step change um, that you can see, for example, uh, in Arizona, where by the mid-1980s, you're actually operating around a different mean. This shows up in a lot of different time series. Um, so this is the step change in the timing of spring onset, winter wheat headings, center of mass and stream flow, which is when more than half of the uh, annual stream flow actually passes the gauge, uh, fire frequency and area burn. And in all of these cases, um, you've got a step change uh, that occurred right around the 1970s, the mid-1980s. So if, if one of the things that you've been thinking is that the changes, the secular changes that we've seen of late that's been attributed to, to uh, greenhouse gas emissions is gradual, uh, for the cool season, you're wrong. Probably for the warm season, you're right. But for the cool season, it's actually occurring in, in step fashion. And we've been actually tracking this of late uh, using a spring index, which is basically an index based on T max and T min that you can calculate for any station that takes into account uh, chilling requirements and accumulated uh, degree days. Um, so it's basically a little phenological model that is then validated with the only phenological data that we have that's wall-to-wall, -wall, which is a, a network of, uh, of uh, stations where uh, lilac uh, pheno phenophases have been observed uh, since about 1956. So we have this data, this actual phenological data that we can use to validate this phenological model. So you can compute the spring index and then play all sorts of games. So for the West, you can actually compute them um, for any station where you got T max, T min, there are about uh, oh, like 265 stations. This is a paper we're almost done with right now. In fact, uh, by early next week, we should be done. Uh, if you take the spring index and calculate an average it for the Northern Rockies and the Central Rockies, one of the things that you'll, you'll see is that there's a step change that occurs right around 1976 if you're in the north, north of about 46 degrees, and then 1984 if you're in, in the south. Um, and this is another way of representing the same data. So in the red are all those stations that show a change right around 1976, and the blue are stations that show a change right around 1984. And again, the, the uh, hinge point is right around 46 degrees. So we've done a principal component analysis on the spring index, and this is the first principal component, which is this sort of subcontinental scale pattern um, where it's either the spring is either earlier, um, or, or it's later, but the whole region is doing exactly the same thing. And uh, the time series is down at the bottom again showing this uh, inflection point right in the 19, uh, not around 19, uh, right in the 1980s. And this looks like the Pacific North American pattern, the PNA. I don't have time to show you exactly why I'm saying that, um, except I'll, I'll, have a couple, I'll have a figure coming up in a second that will explain it a little bit better. The second principal component analysis is this north-south pattern that is typical uh, both in temperature 
and geopotential heights uh, for the northern annular mode. Uh, so the second pattern with the time series below is actually the northern annular mode. Uh, and we've demonstrated it in a number of ways. Again, I don't have a lot of time to explain it. So the two main patterns are of variability in the onset of spring, both year to year and decadally, are the PNA and the NAM. Just an example, I, uh, I'm, I'm taking the uh, uh, composite of 300 millibar heights from early spring years minus late spring years, and the pattern that you see there is a the pattern that I showed in the map of the PNA uh, with an intensified elution low, relatively uh, high geopotential heights over Canada, uh, and then matched over on the other side uh, on, in, in, in the big pond, matched by something that looks very much like the Northern Atlantic Oscillation. So that's year-to-year -year variability. It's very much driven by the PNA. And then when you do this decadally by subtracting 1986, subtracting 1971 and 1986 from 1986 to 2000, you get the same exact pattern. So the PNA is actually pretty critical for modulating spring onset either year-to-year -year or decadally. The thing that the reason why this is actually very significant is that the PNA tends to have a lot of memory. Um, if you look at where that blue low pressure uh, area is, that's the area of the Aleutian low. Whenever the Aleutian low gets intensified by December, when the PNA actually goes in its positive phase, anytime that happens by December, it's actually fairly predictive of the onset of an early spring that in the, in the immediately following season. Uh, and you can see that in this diagram. The PNA actually has a lot of persistence. Um, if it goes in one phase or the other by December, then it's predictive of an earlier onset of spring. This might actually give us a lot of predictability, not only for things like stream flow, but also for things like fire. Most of you are familiar with Tony Westerling and, and, and others' uh, paper that came out in Science in 2006 where they took fire statistics from the Western US and, and actually analyzed them in great detail. And this is just a couple of little summaries. At the bottom, you have the time series in the red bars of the frequency of fires exceeding 1,000 acres. And then the black line is actually uh, the uh, spring and summertime temperatures plotted on top. And you can see how well correlated those, uh, uh, those two trends are. And then across the top is a scatter plot showing uh, the fires exceeding 1,000 acres against the uh, temperature anomaly, again showing uh, the relationship between the two. So what this means is that um, uh, for if you use a hydrologic index, for example, center of mass, uh, again, that's when 50% of the annual stream flow actually flows past the gauge. Late snow melt and early snow melt years have completely different distributions of fire activity. So early snow melt years tend to have a lot of fires uh, exceeding uh, 1,000 acres, and late snow melt years have fewer. There's a little bit of a bias here because you're using a, a snowpack indicator, a snowmelt indicator, uh, like center of mass. And so that's probably not as good for, for example, for the southwest where snowpack is not as regular. And so what we've done is we've actually compared the two. So we're in the process of finishing a paper right now um, where we, instead of using center of mass, which was what was used in the uh, Westerling et al. paper, uh, we actually used the spring index. So here what you're looking at is the correlation number of fires greater than 1,000 acres for each year between 1970 and 2003, and then the center of mass uh, versus the center of mass, and then versus the spring index. And you can see that both, uh, both indices actually uh, perform relatively well. Uh, I want to show you the results. The spring index actually does much better for the southwest. Now, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things going on, and I'm, I'm having to go back through my whole career over the last 30 years and re-examine things that I've done and rethink them all together. This is a paper that Tom Swetnam and I published in Science in 1990 about the relationship between El Nino, La Nina, and fire activity in the Southwest. It went like this. Basically, if it's El Nino, uh, it's going to be relatively wet and you're not going to get very much fire activity in the ensuing uh, dry season after the winter. But if it's La Nina, it's going to be dry during the winter time, and then you're going to get a lot of fires. And this holds up over the last few hundred years. We've done this actually with tree ring reconstructed uh, uh, Palmer drought severity index and fire scar data integrated for the whole southwest. And this relationship holds very steadily over the last 300 years where we have a lot of data. And, but what's happening now is that we're starting to get weird things like you know 2000 and 2005, which are the extreme years. One was El Nino year, 2005, and the other one 
uh, was a La Nina year, 2002. So the La Nina years have now overcome the El Nino years. So fire climatologies are changing. Now is that climate change or something else? It's actually something else. Think about what goes on with fire activity. One is that forests tend to burn during really dry years. So it's, if you have a really, really dry winter in the ensuing uh, dry season, you're going to end up getting lots of fires. That's for forests. But for grasslands and shrublands, it's exactly the opposite. Um, those fires tend to follow relatively wet years and sometimes a sequence of you know, a couple of years that are relatively wet. So the climatologies of shrublands and grasslands is different. And one of the things that's happening right now is particularly for grasslands, is that we now have flammable lowlands in the desert valleys that are burning primarily because of winter annual grasses. And so winter annual grasses really take off during El Nino years. So when, one of the things that's happening now is we've got ignition fronts coming out of the deserts that were not flammable before, moving up and down, moving up the mountain. It can go the other way as well. So during an El Nino year, we may get a flush of winter annuals um, that's wall to wall across the Mojave and the Sonoran Desert, for example, and it'll move upslope, finding the driest woody fuels at the bottom of the mountain. So we're now getting integrated fires between desert valleys and the forest that are raising the occurrence of fire during El Nino events. And it's producing fires like the Southern Nevada complex uh, from Vegas to the edge of Utah, which burned about three quarters, uh, burned about three quarters of a million acres and the Cape Creek fire in the same year, in June of 2005, that burned about 250,000 acres. I mean, I don't know about you, but it, it, I live in the Sonoran Desert in Tucson, and it takes my breath away when I see saguaros burning in the night sky. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to go back to the PDO just to show you how important this decadal variability is and how closely tied our ecosystems are to it whether they're native species or non-native species. Uh, Jan Bowers actually put together this really nice paper using herbarium specimens. On the y-axis is the detrended number of target species. So this is species richness from herbarium specimens of winter annuals in the Mojave Desert over time. And she did this to look at the relationship between El Nino and La Nina. But look at the PDO. So, you know, that period in the middle there, 1943 to 1975, is this relatively dry a negative PDO period. Uh, and by the way, this is matched in the Sonoran Desert. These are, these are things that are synchronized at the regional scale. Uh, Leslie Salo took a similar approach in using uh, herbarium specimens to actually track the spread of uh, red brome in a really nice paper that came out in 2005. And so here are uh, the mapped occurrences or appearances in the herbarium records uh, of red brome over time. And when you plot up um, the actual uh, logistic growth curve um, and, and you look at the residuals from the observed uh, herbarium uh, records, one of the things you find is that the spread of red brome was really, really fast during those positive uh, PDO periods and really, really slow during those negative PDO periods. Decadal to multi-decadal variability is actually modulating the rate of spread of these winter annuals. And as you might imagine, decadal to multi-decadal variability also affords us some opportunity for management. Uh, if you really want to manage red brome, uh, try doing it uh, during these negative PDO periods when it's relatively dry, where you, can, you may be actually able to, to uh, not eliminate but reduce the seed bank, whereas in these other periods you're going to have a rough time. So. <clears throat> this decadal to multi-decadal variability is becoming more and more important and there's also a little bit of hope out there, although climatologists are arguing uh, vigorously about this, as to whether or not the, there's some decadal predictability in the climate system, both because of greenhouse gas emissions, but also because there may be some predictability in the North Atlantic. Um, and that uh, predictability in the North Atlantic uh, the North Atlantic may actually modulate ENSO variability uh, on these decadal timescales. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail except, you know, keep your ear to the ground um, and listen for the train coming down the tracks because if in fact the North Atlantic modulates low frequency variability in the tropical Pacific, there may be a lot more predictability than we think. <clears throat>
this is a really interesting uh, idea because most again most of our adaptation is going to be decadal in scale and it's a really interesting idea because it, it raises the point that if the climatologist can actually give us decadal scale predictability do we know enough about ecosystems to make predictions about the ecological responses and I think I don't I don't mean to be a, a course but I think as ecologists a lot of us are going to be standing around with our pants around our ankles when we're asked to actually make decadal scale predictions to go with the, uh, uh, the climatic predictions that the climatic community is going to be able to, to come up with. So in terms of climate change, how much time do I have, Mark? Oh, I'm doing well. In terms of, of, of climate change and what's going on right now, um, we published a paper at the beginning of 2008, a policy paper in science. Uh, a few of us um, hydrologists, uh, two of us, three of us from the USGS, one from the University of Washington, and then a couple of Europeans, uh, and the title of the paper was uh, Stationarity is Dead, Wither Water Management. And uh, what we said is something that all of us have been thinking for a long time, that it was bad enough that climate variability on decadal and multi-decadal scales sort of compromised uh, assumptions that were made um, to come up with uh, design, regulatory, and operational values for water planning that are basically, what you do is you you take stream flow values, or you take some values over time, and then you put together a histogram of those values, and then you do a little bit of calculus to calculate the area under the curve, and you come up with probability distribution or uh, the derivative, uh, probability density functions, um, that actually uh, can give you the uh, chance of occurrence at any given year of any value. And then you can use those values to manage you know, building reservoirs or managing floodplains or managing water supplies, um, you had to actually make the assumption that those values were actually distributed randomly through time. In other words, at the mean and the moments, things like the standard uh, deviation uh, and, and, and the skew, kurtosis, and the like, that those things were actually stable through time, that didn't vary through time. Well, <clears throat> now that climate change has happened, that's obviously not true. So this was a central tenet in water planning. This was the math that we used since the 1950s, since something called the Harvard Water Program, to manage water resources not only in the United States but also across the globe. Um, so this, we, we are now fairly aware of the fact that stationarity is dead and that climate change compromises this central tenet in water and ecosystem management. The natural systems fluctuate within an unchanging and well-defined envelope of variability. This assumption is embodied in the concepts of hydrological stationarity and um, also the historic range of ecological variation, which we've heard some, something about in this, uh, in this workshop already. Um, now, what this means is that adaptation to climate change will require retooling a lot of traditional methods like historic uh, hydrologic stationarity and, and HRV uh, and developing alternative ones that are better suited for managing resources and ecosystems under what is clearly now a non-stationary climate. Um, we're already starting to think about this uh, for, um, uh, for water planning. I'm not going to go through all of the details. I encourage you to read this paper. I think it's actually a very uh, interesting paper and we've gotten a lot of uh, attention uh, for the paper. Um, but I, I did want to end with a couple of slides about a woman that's actually written, a, an environmental lawyer by the name of Robin Kundis Craig, who's written a parallel paper called Stationary is Dead, Long-Lived Transformation, Five Principles for Climate Change Adaptation Law. And you can actually go online and find this uh, paper pretty easily. Just write Robin Kundis Craig and, and Stationarity is Dead and you'll get there. And this is what she's saying. She's saying that American law and policy are not keeping up with the need for adaptation, even though adapting law to a world of continuing ch climate change will be far more complicated than addressing mitigation. <coughs> Environmental and natural resources law are currently based on assumptions of ecological stationarity and pursue goals of preservation and restoration. Um, so preservation and restoration in and of themselves are actually stationary assumptions. Those assumptions and goals do not fit a world of continual, unpredictable, and nonlinear transformations of complex ecosystems. Altering basic paradigms of environmental and natural resource law from preservation and restoration based on assumptions of stationarity to a paradigm of increasing resilience and adaptive capacity based on assumptions of continuing unpredictable and nonlinear change will require different kinds of legal amendments and 
perhaps even new laws for different regulatory contexts. Environmental natural resource law is going to change in a radical way because of non-stationarity. So in closing, here are some issues and challenges for ecosystem science and management. The first one is that integrating decadal to multi-decadal variability will help us adapt to climate change. And so we better move on that as quickly as possible. And we're all going to have to become better versed in, in, in climate change, uh, in climate science. Forecasting and adaptation will focus on annual to decadal timescales. Again, can we predict ecosystem responses on these timescales? Uh, the most successful approaches will be the ones that best assimilate both short and long lead uh, climatic ecological forecasts. Uh, and then finally, as large scale ecological disturbances increase with plant invasions and climate change, there'll be an increasing need to manage the products of succession across jurisdictions at regional scales and with ecological goods and services in mind, something that we've never done. Um, one of the things that we need to do is after disturbances, and they're all occurring uh, very rapidly and synchronously right now, the best thing that we can do is increase patchiness and throw nature out of sync. Climate variability tends to synchronize ecosystems uh, to some degree. And when you add warming to it and you increase the rate of disturbance, that increases the synchrony. We don't want to, 50 years from now, we don't want to be dealing with the same age cohort. So we're going to have to throw nature out of sync. Uh, the long-term success of post-disturbance treatments, including assisted migration, will require a novel mix Novel mixes of species phenotypes and genotypes adapted to future, not past climates. And I think we're, I was asked to give a talk uh, for the, uh, the Seed Trade Association. And it was, they asked me to talk about climate change and climate variability. And it was very clear that they're looking for direction and instructions. What is, you know, how are they going to have to gear up their industry to respond to this particular challenge? And I think that's going to be really critical because right now I think they're pretty rudderless. We're not giving them the direction they need. And so I'll stop by uh, with one final comment that maybe the title of this conference uh, should be changed from restoring the West to enabling the West uh, to adapt uh, to a, a changing and uncertain climate. Thanks very much. No, and part of the reason is, yes, um, what Connie is asking is whether in the Barnett et al. Uh, science paper where they attributed most of the hydroclimatic changes that I pointed out to greenhouse gas emissions, um, whether there's any possibility there for decadal predictability. There might be as far as temperature is concerned um, in general, but in a gradual way since the Barnett et al. paper doesn't really include a step change. Um, so, and I, th I think this is w how we might actually see the future, and that is decadal to multi-decadal variability that answers to natural factors um, producing step changes. So it's not just non-stationarity, it's also discontinuity, that we may actually see things not as some gradual trend, but as a sequence of steps. And so we may have to rely on whatever decadal predictability we can get out of the oceans uh, that's unrelated uh, to greenhouse gases.